and um, it's a rather intense course uh, meant to take you from being your uh, a basic um, English teacher uh, who's done the CELTA, which is the Cambridge English Language Teaching, or sorry, not the Cambridge Certificate for Certificate for English Language Teaching of Adults. Uh, that's sort of your first step uh, if you're uh, getting into ESL teaching or English language teaching. Uh, the Delta is something that you do if you are aiming towards something towards an administration role or a materials development or something along those lines. I've been working on this since the uh, beginning of September, and I'm now on Unit 6 as I, uh, I've, uh, as I have on the, the screen right now. And Week 5 was a break. Um, sorry, I'm not on Unit 6. I'm on Unit 8 right now because this uh, I finished this a couple weeks ago, uh, or at least I finished most of it. Uh, I want to review some of the things uh, of, that happened in Unit 6. I'll get to Unit 7 as well uh, later on. If you're wondering how much time uh, you should be spending on these, uh, these units or the, the, this course, uh, the, the test, the exam is scheduled for December 7th, and there are 13 units total in this uh, this whole course. Uh, let me see if I can uh, get the whole course up once again and that way we can take a look at the um, the whole uh, outline of the course itself. Um, let's see right here. Delta, delta, there we go. Um, open with all right, so uh, we'll take a look at this. So here you'll see this is the whole course outline that I have. Um, units one to four, uh, then unit five was a full mock exam uh, course, reading catch up, so it was like sort of a week off basically. Uh, I'll talk about unit six today. I uh, finished unit seven on Monday, now working on unit eight, and then unit nine, so that's a lot next week actually. Uh, that everything sort of ends that's actually kind of shoot that's worrisome <laughs> that means there's only there's only four more weeks another month until the uh, uh the exam so that, that that's first week of november second week of november third week of november one week off and then the week after that i guess is when the uh, uh the uh what do you call it exam will be let's just take a look here um right yeah well you guys can see it doesn't really matter right so that would be December 7th is right here, right, uh, is when that's going to happen. And uh, so that's, we're sitting at what, first, last week of October, so unit 9, unit 8, unit 9, uh, 10, 11, one week off, two weeks off, and then, okay, so another five weeks or so. Uh, which is good, it would give me a lot of time to catch up on some of the reading. And there is quite a bit of reading uh, that has to be done if you are going to gain the familiarity with the terminology. So how long do you have to spend? I know, sorry, it took a while to uh, respond or answer this question. An hour a day is what I was told. Most people that I uh, know who are taking the, the class are, uh, or preparing for the exam, are spending about an hour to two hours a day. Uh, or trying to, I say trying to, but if you're working full time or if you have a family, uh, probably very difficult to uh, find a concentrated amount of time like that. Bits and pieces uh, is is uh, a good idea as well. Um, on the weekends, however, so Saturdays and Sundays, that's where I'm spending the majority of my my study time. That is probably three hours, four hours. Uh, yeah, not less than three hours on a Saturday. And on a Sunday. Following that on Monday, that's when I typically do uh, the homework. Uh, and so what that means is that on uh, throughout the week, I'll spend time reading the, the text of the essential reading. Uh, I don't normally work on the unit itself until uh, the weekend. And that way I can sit through it and just go through it all at once. I don't like picking this off one by one because it's, I find I get into a better flow uh, by just trying to do the whole thing at once rather than uh, page by page sort of thing. 
uh, but I can pick up one of the books, read a bit of that, whether it's on my computer or on my iPad, uh, and being able to uh, uh, go through those. The, the books that have sort of been the ones that I've been going to quite a bit uh, are the grammar books, so it's Martin Parrott. Um, there's another one I've been reading, testing, the testing book. Is that Hughes? Uh, that, that one's pretty easy to read. You're not, there's not, you're supposed to be able to talk about the terminology, but in terms of reading it, if you've done any teaching uh, before, it's uh, pretty easy to read itself. Um, reading as well, that's uh, Penny Ure, I think, um, who has a book. You read the whole thing, and uh, it, it, the, fir the introductory, the first couple chapters, I think, are her, are her just sort of talking about um, what's wrong with teaching reading and stuff like that. Uh, or was that the listening book? Uh, I can't remember. I'll have to look. We'll, we'll get to it in a bit. Uh, phonology, this is the book, uh, sorry, this is the part where you have to learn your, your uh, phonetics and stuff like that. So Sound Foundations is the uh, book that you're supposed to be supposed to be reading for that. Speaking, I uh, can't remember what the book was for that. Then the exam focus, we'll take a look at that. So there's the whole course for you. Uh, 11 weeks total, minus one, two, three. So it's actually, um, what, eight weeks total of content, but it's a lot of content at once. And But as I said, when you start reading these essential readings, the books that they recommend to read, uh, and the books that you have to read, plus the course, it's a lot of reading, and it all starts to overlap. But that's the idea, is to be able to speak like one of them, to talk like one of these academics who deals with this stuff on a regular basis. So it's a shared terminology. It's a shared communicate, method of communication, uh, which is what the, the Delta uh, wants to do, because with uh, mo Module 1, building a base, I guess technically it's supposed to go into Module 2, two but a lot of people go module one then module three and then do module two later on um, and the reason for that is because module one being heavy th heavy theory gets you sort of talking the lingo speaking the lingo uh, familiar with the landscape um, it's kind of like if you're doing a master's degree uh, you're doing sort of a survey in your first chapter of your dissertation uh, whereas module three would be i want to say it's your practicum but it's not it's actually more of a theoretical application of what you're trying to do. So you, you do an experiment, uh, whereas module two would be your actual practicum where you're actually in the class, you're designing stuff and you are uh, presenting it uh, and then getting feedback on that. So, uh, but you don't have to do them in order. I am doing module one right now. Hopefully I pass this. I'm actually aiming for a merit if I can. We'll see, knock on wood, uh, that it all goes well. Module three, hopefully will start in uh, January of uh, next year. And then module two at some point um, down the line. All right, so let's uh, get into this. Let's take a look at the uh, the different components uh, parts of this. Well, you'll see that I've only done 77 of the 84 check marks, which are uh, available. I'm not I'm not overly concerned about that. And the reason why was because this grammar section was just a whole bunch of. It was a lot. It was a lot of every every single thing. There, there was also no tutor task. So I didn't really feel as, as much need to get through it all. Um, but all of this was very intense in terms of very technical and breaking down sentences uh, in, into clauses and things like that. Uh, and it was just, you read enough and you go, it starts to grind on you sort of thing. But okay, so this is chapter 19 and chapter 20 of Martin Parrott's Grammar for English Teachers. If there is one grammar book that you're going to get, it's going to be this one because this is basically what the whole course is based off of. Um, now, whether or not you could ace the course, uh, or sorry, ace the exam without doing the course but reading this book, I don't know. There's another book um, called About, is it About Language, About English? Uh, I can't remember. Uh, that uh, talks, that has a whole bunch of, exercises uh, in it uh, that are geared towards ESL um, English language teachers and uh, it's a little bit more uh, it, it's much more just all exercises getting you thinking like breaking down clauses and how um, how you would sort of understand the, the sentence breakdown and component constituent parts breakdown whereas grammar for English 
Uh, I've been highlighting it. Uh, and anyone who's read the book would be like, so you just, why? <laughs> uh, and the reason why is because every line in that book is something informative that you probably have to know or be aware about. And by that, I mean is that when he talks about breaking down the constituent parts of a, cl- of a, of a sentence, um, so working at a phrase level, for example, um, being every sentence he talks about, every paragraph, he gives an example of what a phrase would be. And as a result, you're, you're, if you're highlighting everything, everything is important. You have to just read it and absorb it and understand uh, the idea behind it and understand how to talk about it, the terminology, um, and then also be able to recognize how to break down a sentence uh, for, the, for the exam. Key terminology would be this. So your, your phrases, your noun phrase and verb phrase, the head words, uh, and then a modifier, a sentence constituent, which is just parts of a sentence, your subject, your dummy subject, there or it, uh, direct or indirect objects, so with transitive or intransitive verbs, complement what, uh, what sort of uh, goes alongside with any number of, like usually it's uh, the, the noun or a verb complement of all. Adverbial, how, when, or where something is being done. Why is it an adverbial? I don't know why they use this, this horrible, tricky word that sounds like an adverb and helping the, uh, the verb, but I guess when you say how was something done, when was it done, where was it done, that qualifies the verb now, doesn't it? So there's your adverbial. Um, a clause, so it's like another part of the sentence. Imperative, like don't do that. Don't forget to study. Don't is your imperative form. Subject verb, subject verb inversion. So that comes in um, play with like questions. Uh, and I'll have have you ever? You have ever? Have you ever done something? Have you ever read that book? Have you read that book? You read that book means you read that thing. Have you read that book makes it into a question. Same with uh, um, doing. What was it if you're making it a negative. Didn't you do that? Didn't you read that book? Oh, that's still a question, I guess, and a negative. Fronting, um, okay, that's where you put the, the adverbial or the adverb at the front. Uh, like walking, he entered the classroom sort of thing. Uh, along those lines, I, I can't exactly remember to tell you the truth. An auxiliary verb, that's your, your don't, your would, should, could, like a, a lot of your modals are auxiliaries. Uh, noun phrase, Verb phrase, I didn't qualify, I didn't define these, but noun phrase is basically anything that is a noun that is all part of the noun. So it all goes together. Uh, the very old man. So the very old man is a noun phrase, but the very old man also contains a head word and some modifiers. Uh, so the head word would be man, and the modifiers would be very old. So there, that's uh, all of that constitutes, constitutes, makes up, comprises, uh, constitutes a noun phrase. A verb phrase would be like, um, got up out of the room or getting up out of the room um, or quickly leaving the room would be a verb phrase. Uh, so slowly left the room would be your, your verb phrase as well. Um, so this all, there you go, there your exam aims and syllabus aims as well. So you can see, uh, it does talk, it's a lot of material coming in for this grammar, and grammar keeps on popping up quite a bit throughout the, um, the course. How many uh, different grammar parts are there again? There are seven, uh, so unit eight, chapter eight, unit eight is the last grammar chapter. Uh, so here we go into levels of analysis. It's, by now you've read chapters 19 and 20 of Giffelt. Uh, Okay, so I'll stop reading here and go read that first. <laughs> what is a clause, sentence, constituents, and phrase? What is a clause? Sentence can contain more than one clause. Um, a clause is basically anything that can sort of, uh, it's here, that is usually a subject, verb phrase, and a complement or object. Sentence constituents are what make up uh, a clause or make up a sentence. And what is a phrase? Phrase is formed by a head word and modifier. So a head word again, very old man. Man being the head word, modifiers being very old. Um, yeah, something along those lines. Uh, where is it? It gives this big, an adjective, big dog. Uh, the big dog. Okay, so here's the example. Noun phrase. So dog is the, uh, the, the, 
the noun, the modifier, is the uh, adjective big, and then the determiner, oh, right, because we're doing the delta and have to rip everything apart, if you forget to mention that the is the determiner, it's not a dog, it's the dog, or the, so you have to you have to actually describe what that word is doing. And this is one of the things that about the grammar part uh, portion of the delta is that you literally read every sentence you read needs to be ripped apart and labeled and understood the function of. Um, and so like when you talk about like here, here's a good example here. Constituent could be as small as a single word, noun, a verb, adjective, uh, adverb, preposition, determiner, right? So when you read a sentence, you would have to, if they've emboldened those words, you have to be able to identify uh, their form, their meaning, and their, their function and their use, basically. So it's um, a lot. And that's why, like, reading this grammar part, that's why I never got through it, because it was just chapter, part after part after part was another thing. Like, here's another explanation of some stuff that you're supposed to know and be able to read a sentence and explain how it all fits together. Uh, working at phrase level. Do they just give it? Oh, okay, so yeah. So this is what they would do for the uh, the test. They'd give you an emboldened portion and then ask you about the meaning, uh, form, and uses of it. And here, this one asks us to identify the noun phrases, verb phrases, adjective phrases, adverb phrases, and preposition phrase. Preposition phrase would be like on the left. Uh, adverb phrase would be uh, rather noisily. Adjective phrase, um, I would say quite frankly, but it's not. Uh, fairly mediocre would be an adjective phrase. Verb phrase would be quite frankly, and noun phrase would be a large and very expensive pen. Let's double check if I actually got that right. I can't remember what the answers I gave were. Noun phrase, quite frankly, uh, number three is an adverb phrase. Uh, number four is an adverb phrase, so uh, number five is an adjective phrase, there we go. Uh, but I was right with number six on the left is a, a PP preposition phrase. Uh, number nine, I said was an adjective, I think, I hope I did. Double check that if you want, adjective phrase, there you go. Uh, you have to be able to do that, um, or else they won't give you full marks for it. Some grammatical functions of constituents. Oh my goodness, so again, here we go. Labels, <laughs> Um, wow. <laughs> Lots of stuff that you have to go through. And this is all just for this grammar section. Uh, we don't need to spend too much time on this. But the, needless to say that this uh, unit eight, uh, sorry, unit six uh, chapter, the grammar chapter was quite a lot of work and very, very intensive. Uh, in terms of uh, you, the concentration. Uh, other clause variants. Oh, I didn't do this one, so now I'm getting the check mark and I didn't actually look through it. Um, good time to look through it, I guess. <laughs> uh, so this is, I guess, the end. Yeah, there's other parts. Study the following sentences. Describe what sort of variant features each one contains. Explain why they might have chosen them. Adverbials, adverbials all of a sudden, out of nowhere, are fronted. All right, so here we go. Uh, where are we? All of a sudden, out of nowhere, that's fronting, came the sound of uh, thunder and gunfire. So you actually can't, you can't invert though, that uh, came the sound of thunder and gunfire out of nowhere, all of a sudden, that wouldn't sound good. So instead, in English, we front some of this, uh, some of this information. You could say, out of nowhere came the sound of thunder and gunfire all of a sudden. A little odd. Out of nowhere, all of a sudden, came the sound of thunder and gunfire. Would be okay as well. Uh, but all of a sudden, out of nowhere, uh, doing your... your I go, is that a timestamp? Uh, out of nowhere, now another adverbial, <laughs> fronting adverbial of direction. Who knows? Came the sound of, the sound of thunder and gunfire. So, uh, so these fronting is where we sort of put information at the beginning of the sentence that wouldn't make sense, wouldn't make as much sense putting it uh, later on as well. Um, this would, would this be another one? Never in the history of human conflict. Never in the history. It has so much, <clears throat> excuse me, by so many uh, to so few. 
on no account. This is another type of fronting as well. May anyone enter the exam room after 9 a.m. Uh, so being able to uh, figure that out. Good idea. Uh, let's see the suggested answers. What is it? I'm going to get this one. Another in inversion of subject. Anyone, an auxiliary, may, uh, after a negative, a verbial on no account. Oh, there we go. I was right. It's, uh, well, it was an adverbial. Is it fronted? Effect is to emphasize the absoluteness of the ban on anyone. Yes, okay. That's the explanation. Great. Gotcha. Uh, what did I say? Never. Number seven. This is an example of subject so much. And first auxiliary has being inverted because of the negative adverbial never in the field of human conflict. All right. So, hey, negative adverbials. So, again, there's not just adverbials. There's negative adverbials. Is there a positive adverbial or just an adverbial and negative adverbial? The more wordy you are about, I, okay, I got to qualify this because anyone who's, they make a point in the Delta program to do everything by bullet point, no flowery prose. But if you have a chance to say something like it's a negative adverbial, do it. You can just, and the negative adverbial is, you know, something that is no, not, never, not going to happen sort of thing. That's your, uh, your negative adverbial, but I guess with the, I don't think you'd write a positive adverbial. I've never seen that. Let's put it that way. Other variations of word order. Yes, this. I mean, this is how very intense it is in terms of looking at this grammar. Um, Jumbo, is an alternative word order possible, or why? What effect does that alternative word have on the meaning of the sentence? Can't I, Dickens, stand? I can't stand Dickens, right? I went to Italy in 1983. Went to Italy, I did, in 1983. Now, you'd have to add a word. Uh, in Morocco, he worked between 1980 and 1982, which it would, in Morocco, he worked. Uh, so that'd be emphasis on the place, and then him, uh, what he was doing in Morocco, and then the time wouldn't be as important. Or he worked in Morocco... Uh, between 1980 and 1982, which is more um, sort of background information of the guy rather than emphasis on the place of where he worked. Walking is my favorite pastime. My favorite pastime is walking. So you could do that in two ways as well. I do a lot of running in my free time. In my free time, I do a lot of running. Running, I do a lot of in my free time. So you could do that a couple different ways. Um, might not always sound the best, but uh, there are different ways to mess around with the uh, the sentence there. And so this is something that happens quite a bit. Here we go. So can't I stand it? Yeah. The first sentence is the normal or unmarked word order subject plus verb phrase plus object. The second sentence places the object Dickens first, stressing the level of dislike for the author. Yeah, in speaking, one would stress the main verb Dickens. I can't stand. Right. I can't stand Dickens. Dickens, I can't stand. Oh, okay, Dickens, I can't stand. So you're emphasizing, stress the, the that word right there. I can't stand Dickens. I don't think I've really read much of his stuff. I, I can't really uh, comment too much on that, right? Time adverbial phrases. More, you got negative adverbials. You have time adverbial phrases of more than one word in 1983. Normally go at the end of a sentence. So there you go. The first sentence is perhaps the neutral version, second version. The time phrase at the start uh, suggests the chronology of events is in question, emphasizes where they went. Might imply other, other destinations uh, also happen. So yeah, this is, uh, again, going through all the different parts of the grammar. I didn't get through it, but uh, you know what? I'll consider that I've gone through it. Now let's look at the... Um, Ending here, right? Oh, okay. So, yeah, uh, they don't. Ah, here it is. Right. So, this, there's two books I mentioned before. Uh, Martin Parrott, Grammar for English Teachers. That's the one that uh, you'll probably get anyway. That you should be reading if you're going to be doing this course, or if you're preparing for this course, or for the exam. And then Scott Thornbury, 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 Scott Thornbury. I won't say his name again. About language. This is the one that has. That's like chock full of your exercises and stuff like that for English language teachers. Uh, and our, our, our instructor did say, you should be doing a page of that per day. 
And I don't think I've looked at that book since he said that three weeks ago. So shame on me. And I know because that book is actually, that's another intense book though. Because every sentence, you have to look at it, read it, and actually think about it. it. It's another one of those, just like the Martin Parrott book, every sentence is means something that you should know and be aware of. Scott Thornbury's book about language is just exercise after exercise after exercise of like, okay, you did that one, do this, do this, do this. Well, it's very intense. Okay, let's move on to teaching here. Uh, sorry, testing. Uh, my light's going to die. That's what's going to happen. Um, the testing basic concepts and principles summary. So yeah, this is a uh, Andrew Hill, Adrian Hughes, Andrew Hill, Hughes. Oh, I can't remember. Anyway, uh, not too important. Testing for language teachers. Uh, decent book, actually, because um, I'm going to grab that light. Just shut that off there. Right on. Uh, <clears throat> so that, um, that, that book, Testing for Language Teachers, uh, he goes through quite a bit of uh stuff that for for everybody sort of thing that uh uh all sorts of let me see if i can get this thing going for light might be good there we go just a little bit there why not and he uh, goes through quite a bit talks about um face validity uh, as Sorry, I won't say facefully. Whether or not a test is good enough and appropriate for the uses. You'll see the key terminology here, and the whole purpose of this book is to probably does a better job of giving you sort of the explanation of uh, the background of all this terminology. And by that, I mean that talking about backwash, I'm not going to lie, this sounds like it's a, what you do to someone's drink that you don't like um, when he's not looking or something like that. But backwash, you... You almost think like it's it's for that person, that individual in the, the testing experience, but it actually refers to like when you create a test and the the uh, candidate walks away from it and they feel bad about it. That's negative backwash. It means it was it wasn't a very positive experience and might lead to the the candidate going, hmm, I don't like this teacher, I don't like this course, I don't like this school, I don't like this language, and that's negative. I don't like the society. I don't like the you know how it sort of uh, snowballs on, on that sort of thing, builds upon itself, accumulates. Uh, proficiency test, this is, um, and they, this whole unit is, this whole chapter is about the different types of testing, uh, what is a reliable test, um, and then different approaches to testing. So you have your proficiency, your achievement, diagnostic, placement, direct and indirect testing, discrete point, integrative testing, objective and subjective testing, construct validity. Okay, so that there, all of these are the different types of testing methods that you can use uh, to sort of uh, gauge someone's ability in a language. And they're all for different reasons. Um, can I remember? Proficiency is basically just whether or not they're actually good at whatever that is being tested. So language tests like IELTS and TOEFL are proficiency tests. Achievement tests, that would be your GREs, I think. Like, uh, So you, you're tested on a bunch of different things. There's no one thing being tested, but they're all sort of categorized, I believe. Diagnostic tests, checking how good you are at that one thing. Placement tests, where do you fit in a group? Direct and indirect testing. I get this one mixed up, so I'm not going to say anything about that. Um, discrete point and integrated testing, can't remember. Objective and subjective testing. Objective testing means that there's some sort of standards apply. IELTS is famous for this. Same with TOEFL. A lot of standardized tests are like, standardized tests are objective. Uh, so they have a rubric or a bunch of band descriptors that they uh, are basing their judgment on. So if you as a candidate are like, ah, this, he he was rude to me in the test and he, I should get a higher mark. Uh, usually the, the company will look at it and go, but according to our, 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 commonly agreed upon grading measures, uh, you're still that mark. So, <laughs> I mean, he might have been a bit of a dick, but uh, uh, he was accurate in his scoring, right? Uh, and that that's that happens quite a bit in standardized testing. I mean, and it's not just for, um, like, any one type. It's, uh, it's 
a lot, uh, basically. Subjective testing would be more like your uh, university teaching. Uh, uh, if you're where you have a basis, uh, like a, a grade breakdown, where you would measure students grade against some rubric or uh, description of points, uh, grade breakdown. But then your ability to grade them would change or would depend on whether or not they sort of are able to make a better argument in a certain way, like the grammar might not be 100%. But their argument might be very convincing. Uh, their argument might be convincing, but their sources might be garbage. So, like that's more of subjective testing, where uh, there's a bit more of there's no real basis or no standard method of being able to evaluate or determine what their score should be. Uh, like you can't really can you score a point for each source? Can you score a point for every gr grammatical mistake? Or is there some basis of you know as a teacher? as an instructor at the university or any evaluation uh, entity and evaluation area, um, do they have to sort of take a few factors into account and then give a whole holistic or a um, sort of a, a, a subjective opinion on what your grade could be? At which point you can say, well, you're wrong, Mr. Teacher or Miss Teacher. I deserve a better one. They report you to the administration office. The administration office gives you a call and you're like, I don't know, let me take a look at the essay again. You're like, sure thing, let's give them another five points. Or, no, I actually don't like this essay. I found more errors and I'm going to take more marks off. And another minus 10 because this is now late sort of thing, right? I mean, something along those lines where there's, there's a bit more uh, of subjective testing, that uh, subjectiveness, a personal opinion that goes into uh, the, uh, uh, the score. Construct uh, validity, so whether or not something is built properly for uh, that level or for the, uh, the indicated level. Content validity, so are the topics actually useful uh, and appropriate for the test being and what is being tested. Face validity, um, does it look okay? Face validity, I think that's also the first impression of it, I believe. Reliability, uh, can it be replicated basically if... Uh, you know, if it's stormy outside, the power goes out, uh, tests across uh, different campuses or different rooms, can the, is the test still going to be marked the same way? Multiple choice, you know that one, A, B, C, or D. Drop the pen. <laughs> uh, STEM, I don't know, distractors, um, podcasts, <laughs> I don't know, distractors, I mean, something that I guess is, uh, is that within the, the question itself? where uh, a multiple choice or even like a fill in the blank would you sort of have a four there's one right answer there's two that are, that could be it and then there's one that's like completely not it at all unless you're just not and if you're if you choose that you've not been paying attention at all so distractors are something that are not accurate but can take your attention away from what the actual answer uh is i believe options are clothes uh clothes and gap fill, gap fill, so that's like fill in the blanks. Close are those um, drop-down menus that you see on a lot of websites. They used to be very popular when the you, when the interwebs got uh, first started spreading back in the early 2000s, late 90s to early 2000s. Um, so you'd have a sentence and then you'd have, click on a drop-down and you'd have two or three different answers or whatever. You'd have to pick the right one. Uh, let's take a yeah, look at the concluding comments. What's, uh, so it's just a one book here. Yeah, so uh, it's this one here that you have to read. Uh, Testing for Language Teachers. That's the one. And you just read that book. And with a lot of the essential readings, if you read the this book first and then do the unit, you'll you'll fly through the unit so much more, uh, so much quicker. But that being the case, you can still do the unit without reading this book. Uh, it's just that the way that they do this there's a lot more, I would actually say there's a lot more distractions in the units themselves because you have to keep on, it's all like homework, right? And it, it gets, you, you're sort of pressured to keep on answering questions. Whereas the book, no one's pestering you for an answer of what the sub inverted subject is, right? You're just like, you read it and you're like, good, inverted subject, I gotcha. <laughs> you know, sip your beer, move on to the next paragraph. Here it's like, inverted subject, sip your beer, and answer the question now, right? So it's, there's a lot more focus on uh, being active and participating within with the uh, 
the material rather than the books where you can just read it and go, yep, yep, got it, even though you might not actually get it all, right? But that's why you read the essential reading and then you read the, uh, then you go through the unit and that way you are building on top of each other, gaining a familiarity with the, uh, the um, terminology that's necessary to write this exam. Yeah, I mean, literally, you got to start thinking and talking like these people. Um, and by these people, I mean these academics uh, in that do this, who are dealing with material development, um, administration roles. And so like if you're dealing with a principal or a school administrator uh, or a, a publisher who's dealing with education, can you talk the lingo? Um, if they ask you, well, we don't really need any more books about conversational English. We need books about, you know, uh, fronting uh, for Chinese students or something like that. And I don't mean like buying Lamborghinis. I mean like putting the words in the appropriate order, word order for uh, um, IELTS or something like that, or uh, vocabulary development for medical students, like things like that. Can you figure out a methodology to do it? And so how would you assess someone's needs? How would you uh, talk about what you actually are able to do with your uh, knowledge and abilities. All right, let's move on. Um, going on to reading here. Uh, this is another book. I think you only have to, yeah, so you have to read The Introduction of Grelet, Developing Reading Skills. Sorry I'm going on for so long, but this is, uh, this really did, yeah, another very long one. Uh, but... I think this, if you read this book, uh, F. Grelet, F. Grelet, the introduction, he goes through pretty much everything that the unit does, and it's very thorough and very actually easy to read. Um, another one of these books where he, it's kind of like almost everything he says is actually important to, to be aware of. Um, talks about textual analysis, uh, analysis, mixed skills, integrated skills, uh, yeah, sure. Intratextual links and relationships, um, integrating reading with other language skills and aspects of lexis and grammar, um, and yeah, some different exercises and stuff like that. So uh, this one, it's not a difficult read at all. Uh, you can certainly breeze through it pretty quickly. And then if you go through the unit itself, uh, it's pretty, um, pretty, pretty easy at that point terminology right okay so here we go so this is some of the terminology that you have to be aware of <clears throat> i won't go through the all the answers but scanning skimming intensive reading co-text extensive reading sub vocalization that's where you're reading out loud reader schemata that's uh, activating what the reader already knows inferencing skills uh, being able to understand some sort of illusion or um Something that's not in front of you, but you can understand is being associated with the task, text. Uh, Top-down processing and bottom-up processing. Actually, I do want to know what those are, so I'm going to take a look at that. 9 and 10. Double-check those. 9. Top-down processing. Reading, which takes in the whole text first, then proceeds from global understanding to a closer reading to understand the details. Bottom-up processing. Reading, which begins from word and sentence level, gradually building up to understanding the whole uh, of the understanding of its parts. So that's almost like your grammar translation process right there. I remember when I studied languages at university, Latin, uh, you, we sometimes we try to start down, top down processing, but uh, it always felt like we we're doing reading the words and the sentences before you actually get to the, the whole text itself. Uh, so there you go. Um, important sub skills and strategies. What are these? Uh, good question. It says I read it, so I'll check if I did actually read it. Oh, there you go. Overview, understand the main points, relationships, the organization of the passage, check the references, understanding unknown words. Honestly, if you're a native speaker uh, or if you've gone to um, any sort of university course, if you've taken a university class, like especially if it's an arts class uh, where you have to write an essay, you're probably familiar with all of your, um, like the reading skills that they're talking about. This book is kind of funny that they uh, list IELTS strategies for study from 1996, 26 years ago. Uh, take a look at it. Look at how old it is. Because, I mean, it was published in 1996, but, I mean, it was probably worked on in 1995 and prior to that. Um, 
I'm surprised they don't have any other newer book available uh, to take a look at, but whatever. Uh, so yeah, if you've ever done any sort of university arts or humanities courses, you're probably very familiar with a lot of the terminology they will use in this reading section. Uh, but now making sure that you understand it in the context of ELT, English Language Teaching, that's what this uh, unit is uh, trying to do. Uh, let's move on. Phonology. So again, this one, this is where you have to, um, <clears throat> uh, this stuff, elision or liaison, liaison. Liaison, where uh, the R, J, and W are introduced between words in particular contests. Uh, what, what would be a... Well, British do the R all the time, I dear, I think, right? Is that right? <clears throat> I don't know. Oh, don't hate me for that one. Um, but uh, Levels 2 and Levels 3 of Underhill, Adrian Underhill, Sound Foundations. This book is very intense because uh, he, talk, he tries to describe how the, the muscles move. I talked about this before, and it's kind of awkward to read about how someone's talking about your mouth and your, your 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 tongue is moving inside and it's like well i don't feel my mouth moving that way i don't think my tongue is there right and it depends on your pronunciation which is why you have to deal with phonology uh because whether regardless of whether or not you are british american canadian hello um south african um zambian uh, australian or argentinian there is a certain agreed way to pronounce a word. And with English being a global language, some people call it a lingua franca. I don't. I call it a global language. Um, helping, uh, knowing and understanding how to uh, reduce a or transcribe a word into the phonetic, uh, phonemic script that is what the whole idea of phonology is. And so apparently what's happening, what's been happening with the, the test as of late is that the they have been putting a lot more phonological analysis. So analyzing uh, the sounds of the, the, uh, of the spoken discourse, the spoken text, basically. So they'll, they'll give you the script, but then they'll give you the, the phonemic script of some parts of it. And for that, you have to start reading and noting, understanding where the emphasis uh, and where they are doing these sorts of like assimilating, elighting, using strong and weak forms properly or improperly or uh, liaisoning uh, these uh, these different consonants. This is all part of, uh, uh, and, and, and with that, they might ask you to analyze um, how, whether or not that any sort of advice that you give to a person who wants to reduce their accent and so you have to read the phonemic script and go, okay, well, they keep on doing this and that part. They, uh, they keep on, uh, they're not pronouncing this or they're enunciating this part of the word too much throughout, like systematically doing it. Uh, so being aware of the different parts of dealing with how English words are actually constructed uh, and spoken. And then also, I think one of the other books that they would recommend you read for this is Michael Swan. No, they don't. What? Why not? Okay, interesting. Uh, they go pronunciate, pronunciation of English. Um, I have not looked at these books yet, but notice how Scott Thornbury uh, shows up again at, about language. So again, m probably more... Um, what does he talk about this? They don't give... No, they don't give any direction on which pages of about language. Um, there, there probably is a specific chapter on uh, phonemics and phonology. In that, in that book, I'm not entirely sure. I have not looked at that book very much. And we're already sitting at week eight. So I should probably change that. Uh, Sound Foundations is the, the book that you'll have to take a look at for sure. Uh, let's do speaking. Um, different viewpoint of classroom tasks, activities, and published course book material, which aims to improve students' speaking, uh, appropriating text, uh, making autonomy, make, uh, allowing learners to work on their own uh, and production, making them actually do it, basically. Uh, chapters five and six of Thornbury, How to Teach Speaking. This guy's written all the books for ELT for the last 20 years, basically. Um, how to Teach Speaking, Listening, Reading, Writing, blah, 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 blah. How to Teach Teaching. <laughs> I actually don't think he wrote that book, um, but uh, that's another book that you'll have to take a look at. Um, 
this, yeah, so it's all, how much do you want to go through, I guess, right? Introduction. Let's take a look at the introduction at least. <clears throat> Second and final section now focuses on speaking. Speaking one focused on various components of the speaking skill and the underlying knowledge. In this unit, we concentrate on teaching and learning issues. Talk about accuracy, appropriation, controlled or guided practice, fluency, freer practice, and production. In Thornburg's terms, it's autonomy. So speaking on your own, basically. Uh, this is common. I mean, if you've ever studied another language, um, all right here. So they, this is like teacher complaints, right? I don't do much speaking in class. It's too much like hard work running around listening to everyone while they're in pairs and making sure they don't use L1. It does my head. And so this talks about common problems with uh, teaching, speaking, and how it can be very difficult, especially in a classroom, a large classroom uh, environment wherein um, you have a lot of students of probably varying levels or of different nationalities or different uh, like uh, backgrounds. Uh, it can be difficult to sort of uh, monitor, police, monitor. Um, you monitor in the classroom. Uh, going around and checking in on them and making helping them out where they need help, uh, wherever they need help sort of thing. Correcting pronunciation issues, grammar issues, uh, certain questions like idiomatic usage as well. So it uh, can be difficult if you have a large class um this talk yeah basically comes down to what are you aiming to do with your your speaking classes and how are you going to approach it when you have so many uh students or learners at your your in front of you basically how teaching speaking so yeah mastery of speaking skill awareness appropriation and autonomy so uh what do they talk about it so appropriation uh Talking about relation to speaking, guided, where does he talk about appropriation? Appropriation activities are familiar to us all, but probably don't reflect on exactly how they work. Uh, we can models, drills, or chants. Okay. I will learn English. I will learn English. I will learn English. I will get an A. I will get an A, right? <laughs> One of those lines. Writing tasks. Um reading aloud, uh, scaffolding, so building up for learners' um, ability to speak, memorized or rehearsed dialogues, hello IELTS test, basically. <laughs> How can I do better in the IELTS test? Memorize a part two? I don't know. I mean, it's a standardized test and the questions don't change very often, so um, I think that's pretty much what all Chinese teachers tell them. Uh, I know, I, I've, I remember teaching IELTS in a classroom as well and it's just like I would try to be in, you know enticing the students to develop a greater uh, awareness and appreciation for the language and the history of, that's been published in the English language and they're just like yeah, but how do I get a six <laughs> they're Chinese teachers at XDF with the uh, this Chinese school here this private school here the big ah, no I don't do that yeah all, all the answer all the questions the questions don't change here we'll just give you the topics and you can just memorize the answers for them listen for the keywords same with, uh, I guess it's in part two, where they have to just blah, blah, blah for uh, two minutes or so like that. Um, again, a lot of <laughs> teachers would just teach them standard formulaic answers that if they heard like a word, I don't know, Kobe Bryant or, you know, t-shirts or something or clothing, they would just take this this structure and they just plug in the words where they needed to. Uh, just so you're aware um, that although that is one way to teach speaking, uh, if you're a student listening to this, that is not how you get a six. I'm just going to say that. Uh, for the IELTS and for these standardized tests, usually when you get into the upper bands, what's happening is that you're actually able to, you're first of all, you're aware of what you're speaking. Um, but in this, being able to say a sentence and if someone were to ask you about what you mean in that certain part of the sentence as a student as a learner you're actually able to uh, explain it and elaborate on it so if you're not able to do that uh, you're not going to be scoring a higher mark uh, in those uh, in those types of tests just FYI same with uh, university teaching as well it's the same same thing I mean if you can't actually explain what your source means instead of just dropping in a, a quote 
I mean, how much do you expect to get, right? Uh, speaking activities, aims, and usefulness. I can't remember this one. What is this one about? Okay. Now. All right, so, yeah, oh, oh goodness. So it gives you a different bunch of activities, and you have to figure out how to, which ones are sort of the best ones and talk about them. Are they highly accurate or the uh, are they, sorry do they focus on accuracy or they uh, focus on fluency which is what a lot of speaking um, tasks are all about is like are you looking to practice a certain grammar drill which is what i'd love to do in mandarin chinese or are you dealing with fluency which is like what a lot of english teachers want to deal with hey just keep on talking just keep on talking it doesn't matter if you're wrong and then they, they go sit the ielts exam or something and they, they get a horrible grammar score because they're their English teachers like, ah, don't worry about it. They'll understand what you mean. Not when it's a language proficiency test. It's That's the whole point of it, basically. Same with TOEFL and these other ones. Uh, so the uh, being able to just understand what sort of activities are appropriate depending on your goals in the, the speaking test. Uh, promoting fluency and uh, so defining what fluency is and then making sure that Learners can work on their own sort of thing, like being able to get away from that structured uh, response that you taught them and being able to understand what that structure represents and then build on that on their own and not be afraid to do it, even though they might make mistakes or they can't always think of the words and they could pause and use formulaic language to give themselves time to think. Um, so rule of correction, do you correct right away or do you wait? Uh, sometimes with speaking, if you're dealing with fluency, you want to just let them go. If you're dealing with accuracy, you want to stop them when a ma mistake is made, correct them, have them try it, try again. And also sometimes what you can do there is you can scaffold. So, okay, if someone makes a mistake, you stop them. Okay, okay, wait a minute. What was the, what did you say? First part, this second part. Okay. But what about that part? How would you put that all together? So say this again, say that, can you change the sentence? What if we said this instead? Uh, so what if we use this noun instead? You say it again. So you're drilling it and you're scaffolding it, building it up uh, and allowing uh, the, the learner uh, several chances to correct themselves and sort of get it in their mind uh, through repetition when and how to correct as well. All right. So this is all your um, concluding comments. Let's see. Uh, what do they say here? What's that? Uh, and they, there's also a portion on exam focus, which we'll uh, get through. Very quickly, I know. Thank you uh, for uh, bearing with me. It's a good review for me too, as well. To tell you the truth, so I, I gotta take a look at it anyway. Um, so there you go: appropriation, autonomy, and then rule of correction. Um, being able to uh, do these things on your own and being able to pick the most appropriate speaking task uh, for your class and for your learners. Uh, this Scott Thornbury again, the book that you should be looking at. I don't know anybody who's reading any of these books, and I'm not even sure what that one is, to tell you the truth. 1983? Hmm. I'd say it's old, but that might be a little bit too um, harsh to say at this point, right? <laughs> Exam focus. Uh, I don't think I even did this, to tell you the truth. Uh, I think... Oh, maybe I did. Oh, I didn't hand it in. <laughs> so there's a quiz, uh, and there's some just a very easy section as well. Uh, introduction, what was this again? Paper 1, task 5A, 5B, 5C. Ah, uh, right, yeah, five, uh, task 5 is pretty intense. Like, you, you just, you gotta keep on writing about stuff. Just lots of stuff. Um, is this the one that talks about the reduced passive whatever it is? I think it does. I can't remember where it does. Uh, I know on line 40. I think it's right here, read by others, picked up and read by others. Uh, it's a reduced passive something or other. And it's just like, what are you talking about? That's a shortened verb of the passive infinitive, basically. Um, all right. Anyway, so this is 5A, 5B, C, and D. Let's take a look. What do they say about here? Uh, they don't. Okay. All right, so it gives you some information about it. Uh, for this section, use bullet points. You have 30 minutes for parts B, C, and D. 
uh, advised to make as many points as possible. 45 points total. Leave space between each section. Uh, that way you can add more if you need. Parts B and C do not follow a set formula or rubric type, uh, un unlike others. Uh, able to prepare, you'll certainly be asked to identify and comment on form, meaning, and use. So form, meaning, and use of specified extracts. Uh, and you'll also be required to comment on aspects of pronunciation, such as connected speech, uh, which will gain more marks by using phonemic script where appropriate. So this is, again, this is where you, every word you read, if they embolden it, you have to comment on it. You the positive adverbial, negative adverbial, a timestamp of a verbial. Make sure you do it. So here you go. Uh, look at the following extracts from the text. Comment on the form, meaning, and the use. Um, in bold. So it reads, reader, reading, read. So you have to go all four of those, break them down, and be able to comment on their use uh, in in that uh, in those sentences in those in those lines. Oh, here it is. Yeah, read by others. Lines 40 to 41. Uh, come on. Where is it? Quiz answers. Here. Reduced passive infinitive. <laughs> Why? Why is it a reduced passive infinitive? Because it's a shorter version of an infinitive in the passive form. Pa Why is it passive? Because read by others. The verb is having something done by the object. Is that how, is that how it works again? Something along those lines. Uh, omission, ellipted B. Uh, so it's an ellipted B. Um, is reading. It was read by others would be the full. Was, is being read. Uh, so it's ellipted or ellipsis of B auxiliary. So you can say it like that. Or just use the fancy terminology of reduced passive infinitive. Uh, it just makes me laugh, and I wonder if I'll. Leave. I wonder if it's going to come up in the test. To tell you the truth, I wonder. Good question. Uh, all right, and then five C and D practice. Uh, I didn't do this one. I never did hand it in, which is probably a bad thing. But some of the, uh, some of the answers I saw, they were pretty salt. Like, look, at the, this is what you're supposed to do. Uh, that that's your breakdown of paper one, task five, and this is after you've done five A and five B, breaking those down uh, as well. All right, so that is the whole thing for Unit 6 review. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I know that was a long broadcast. Uh, I don't normally go that long, uh, but uh, it was its a lengthy chapter. It really is, and it's one of these things where this grammar one, the, the grammar was long, the reading was long, the testing wasn't so long, but you should be able to breeze through that one pretty quickly. Phonology is very involved. Speaking, not involved, but you have to understand what they mean by certain terms or else you won't be able to use them and you won't be able to uh, analyze uh, the uh, connected speech, which is very important, the phonemic script. So that's something that I have to work on um, going forward, heading into through week eight and week nine next week. Let's see, one more look at this outline. Here, right? So here's the outline. So we just finished talking about unit six. Uh, I'll talk about unit seven another time. I am working on unit eight right now, and then unit nine is next week. Thank goodness. <laughs> There's so much reading to do. With these two uh, weeks, actually, I'm hoping that uh, these are timed practice tests. So we'll uh, sit down and do them on our own. And then I think we get feedback on them as well. And then weeks 12 and 13 are, are break time, so we can uh, still do some reading and buff up some of our knowledge and ask any questions or clarify any points that we need to prior to the uh, the exam, which again is at the beginning of December. Okay, folks, thanks for listening. I appreciate it. I hope you guys are doing well. And if you are doing the Delta, that you're doing well as well. If you're not doing the Delta and you're thinking about it, uh, if you want to have any questions or comments, drop them in the uh, uh, comments below or get in touch through the contact page and I'll uh, do my best to answer your questions. Let's hope I pass this thing. I mean, that would be, oh, that would, I do not want to have to write this thing again. Let's put it that way. So lots of reading, lots of terminology. And every word you read, you must be able to analyze and justify. That's how I understand the Delta test so far. Okay, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. We'll talk again.